Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Southwest. Would you stand and join us for a little bit of worship? I'm coming with a heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Ooh. presence of God's spirit, the very fire and move of God in this place here while we're here this morning, but as we leave this place as well. My name's Andy Hurst, uh, one of the pastors here at St. Luke's. Uh, Matt and uh, Robin are doing some important family business with Macy this morning, moving her, and so y'all be in prayer for them. I know this is not going to be easy, but uh, anyway, I get to be here this morning. We have a picture. Ella, do you have a picture, maybe, of, of, of a little sign? Here it is. Okay, all right. 
Y'all, this is, I was out walking yesterday morning. I was going to say running, but I probably walked more than ran. So I was walking yesterday morning. So our home is prayer conditions. And uh, we kind of need that right now. And uh, it, over at Central Campus this morning, no air conditioning, by the way, in the sanctuary. So they have moved, we've moved the cheese. They're down in the fellowship hall this morning. But y'all, there's, there's heat. I'm not talking the kind of heat that's in the, the thermostat where it's 110. We know about that heat, but there's other kinds of heat, struggles, challenges, at school starting back, all kinds of things going on. And I think these guys at this house have it figured out. And it's not just about this house being covered and protected. It's about this house, this home being defined and directed. So may our church, not just our physical homes, our family homes be prayer conditioned, but may our church be prayer conditioned. Lord, this morning, this is your house. Lord, Holy Spirit, come and do what you need to do in our lives. And again, Lord, cover us, protect us. But also, Jesus, as we worship you, as we sing, as we pray, as we hear the word, may you define us and direct us into who you desire us to be. Thank you for every single person here. Thank you for those watching from home. Come, Lord Jesus, have your way with us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. And I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. Oh, vagabond. And just when I what I've seen I've got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friend burning and bitter neck you just can't keep it moving no you ain't welcome here
worshiping you, Jesus. Are y'all ready? Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Your door. He's calling you over. 
Jesus, we look to you this morning, Father. We're so glad that we have the opportunity to know you, Lord Jesus, that, uh, that you made a way for us, to, for that to be possible, Lord Jesus. And Lord, this morning as we are singing our songs of worship to you, as we are breaking open your word in worship, as we're hanging out with your people in worship, as we're giving as an act of worship, Lord, we just invite your presence just to move in this place today, Lord, in our hearts specifically, but all around this room, Father. Lord, whether there's people who have, uh, who have needs for that, uh, that you would meet those needs, Father. Lord, for there's people who don't know you, Lord, that they would be quickened and they would be awakened uh, to the knowledge of who you are, Lord Jesus. We just ask that your spirit would rest on us in this place, God, that you would come, Lord Jesus, and make yourself known today. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, Spirit, when you move. Take my heart down when you feel the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me come down. Spirit, when you need me, make my heart down. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Spirit, Lord. Alright, church, let's go. I still was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Make my heart 
when you feel the room. You're here and I know you're moving. I'm here and I know you feel me. Oh, fill me with your spirit, Lord. Oh, let's just ask him, church. Let's just ask him. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. just an awareness of you or just an idea of you or just knowledge of you. We're asking for intimacy, fullness of you. So come, Lord, rest on us. Come, Lord, Holy Spirit, and fill us. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we begin that prayer. Jesus teaches us to begin in praise. That's what we've done this morning in worship. We have begun in praise. And then there's just one line for us during this prayer time. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on this earth, even as it is in heaven. So y'all know in heaven, it's wholeness. Y'all know in heaven, His presence abounds. Y'all, y'all know in heaven, there's no more uh, disunity. There's no more divisiveness. There's no more hatred and unforgiveness. There, there's no more sickness. And disease so we're just gonna pray for thy kingdom to come his kingdom to come his will to be done on this earth 
even as it is in heaven. So just think a little bit in your own life, in your own family, in your own relationships, where you need the reality of heaven to become the reality on earth. Just give that prayer. You're just praying like Jesus taught you to pray. Jesus, I know in the house this morning that there are people who are hurting, broken, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And Jesus, you are the great healer, the great physician. So Lord, come and lay your hands upon every person. Lord, those who need physical healing, bring your healing. Lord, do the miracle. Use medicine, use treatments, use whatever you desire, but bring the miracle of wholeness to their lives. And Lord, in our marriages and in our families, there's conflict, there's brokenness, there's, there's discord, there's, there's a lack of trust. So right now, Jesus, touch every person dealing with those issues in their marriage. And Lord, in our families, in our, <laughs> our families of origin or our larger family units, there's people, they don't know you. In heaven, everybody's going to know you. So may... Your kingdom come, your will be done on heaven as it is on, I mean, on earth as it is in heaven. So Lord, every person that we love that you've laid on our heart right now, God, we just silently, we just speak their names to you. That they may come to know you, to know your love, to know your presence, your Holy Spirit working in their life. And Lord, there's other needs. There's folks who, the, the, the month is longer than the, the, the money that's owed for the month is longer than the money being provided for the month. Lord, stand in the gap. Lord, help that to flip. Provide for every family here financially, materially. With the next part of the prayer is give us this day our daily bread. Lord, there are people literally here who need bread. And God, we are mindful that our students are here from Texas Tech and South Plains and LCU. Our students are here from almost every school in this whole LBK area. And Lord, they need your protection. They need your provision. But Lord, they just need you, your presence, like it is in heaven, to be known on this earth. So you go into every classroom, you go into every friendship, you go into everything that's going on in every school, in our city and beyond, and just Lord, show up and do great and mighty things that we, we can't even begin to dream or imagine. I ask y'all to just pray the Lord's Prayer with me this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Um, am I on? Okay. Uh, we have our children's mission project this afternoon. So um, we will be meeting at co-op at about 4.15, 4.30. Um, we serve dinner there. And um, so we let the kids take the lead on that. We have them plate the food. We have them deliver the food. Uh, they raise this money themselves to do that. And so um, any families with kiddos, we would love for y'all to come. But if anybody wants to come see what that's like, uh, I promise you serving with kids is the easiest way to uh, break the ice because they have no fear and no boundaries and they just jump in and start doing it all. So um, even if you don't have young children, we would love for you to join us. If you need information about that, catch me after church and I'll get you the address. Um, kiddos, we are going to dismiss to children's worship. And you guys, um, we're actually going to make some bags to take to the kiddos down there. So even if you can't come tonight, you're going to get to have a hand in some of the mission work that we'll be doing at co-op tonight. So let's go. Out the door. Come on. There we go. Now they're coming. Now they're coming. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for everything you do for our kids and for our church, for Jesus. Thank you. Uh, Lord God, as we uh, just give our offering to you, uh, Lord, we, uh, we just ask, so we're going to put whatever we have, our five loaves and two fish, our little, we're going to put our little into your hands, God, trusting and knowing that you will turn it into your much. 
to change this world. Receive our love and, and just use our gifts to change this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Did we already do the offering and I'm just now praying? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, as long as I don't have to sing during the offering, I think we're okay. All right. Okay. All right. Hang on. I got to get my... I didn't bring my sword up here. I'm in trouble. Did y'all know I have a sword? I do. Actually, this morning, I have two swords because I have... My oldest Bible that I always use to preach, it's lost the page I got to read to you. It's Genesis 1. It's, it's, it's gone. So anyway, uh, this morning, please stand here and receive God's word this morning. I ask you to stand because this word has authority over us. We don't have authority over it. It's his word that tells us not just who he is, but who we are to be. So this morning, here and receive the word of the Lord. This is from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and following. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Lord, this morning, I pray that the same way you created the cosmos, the universe, created us long ago, that you come into this house by your Holy Spirit and you begin to recreate and remake and remind us of who and whose we really are. In your name, Lord, in your name, Jesus, amen. Y'all be seated. So our sermon uh, as we start this new school year together is that we are created for more. Now, I'm convinced about myself, and I'm convinced about our church, and I'm convinced about those who identify as Christians throughout our city and all over our nation, that we have settled for less rather than trusting God for his more. We, we've settled for life mediocre, not life abundant. We've settled or been content to take care of ourselves rather than to engage the world with the love and the power of Jesus. So this morning... God's word takes us all the way back to the very beginning of creation where there's no doubt that God has an ultimate, a beautiful, a, a powerful, world-changing call and purpose for every single one of us here this morning. So, the sermon this morning, three truths about our image of God, our Imago Dei creation. First truth is that we were created with ultimate worth. Rembrandt was one of the most famous artists of all time, and he's famous for his portraits, famous for his painting of over 150 uh, religious paintings, famous for multiple paintings of Jesus on the cross, uh, multiple paintings of Jesus, uh, that parable of the prodigal son. And Rembrandt was notorious for painting himself into the backgrounds of his paintings. This painting is called Christ in the Storm, and this is Jesus with his disciples in the midst of that great storm. And what's interesting if you take out your magnifying glass, in fact, I'm close enough that I could just count, right? If you take out your magnifying glass, what you'll see is that there are 13 disciples, not 12. And if you really look close, what you'll find is one of those disciples is a spitting image of Rembrandt himself. Rembrandt spent $13 to paint this painting that's called the Standard Bearer. Now, it's actually a self-portrait that was made in 1636, this painting, The Standard Bearer, this is worth 
$198 million. Did you hear how much paint he used? $13. $13 of paint then, now worth $198 million now, right? All it took was the touch of the master artist's hand. But the master artist, God the creator himself, the one who created you, he is infinitely greater, superior to Rembrandt. Writer Patrick DeJusto recently tracked down the market value of the, the basic chemical components of the human body. Your body, my body, contains $7.12 worth of phosphorus, $5.95 worth of potassium, about four bucks worth of a dozen other substances for a grand total of $17.18. <laughs> That's what we're worth. But when God breathes, right, his holy, sacred, all-powerful breath into you. You became not just good, but very good. In Hebrew, you became tov meod. All of creation was good. That's, that's tov. God created the light. It was good. God created the land and the seas. It was good. God created the sun and the moon. It was good. God created all the fish and the sea and all the birds of the air. It was good. God created uh, all, all the other living creatures. It was good. But God created humanity. God created you and me. And guess what? It wasn't just tov. It was tov meod. It was very good. Very good, completely good, powerfully and fully good. And according to God's holy word, because we are created in his image, we're not just tov, we're tov meod of infinite value and worth to God. According to God's holy word, Jesus, the only son of God, shed his blood. He paid the ultimate price for you and me because he thought we were of ultimate value. According to God's word, if you're a follower of Jesus, God has poured his very Holy Spirit into you. You are the, the sacred temple of God. You, the temple of God, are of ultimate worth and value to him. Over in Psalm 139, my old Bible, Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, your works are wonderful, I know that full well, man, what do you see when you look in the mirror? I know what God sees. Man, you may look in the mirror and see all the mistakes and mess-ups and, and trouble that has happened in your life, or the sin that has happened, the brokenness that has happened. But when God sees you, you're his beautiful, precious child. Ultimate worth, ultimate value. This is Mother Teresa uh, when she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. Now, Mother Teresa, y'all know, she's like, She's like four foot 11, maybe standing on tippy toes. Little bitty lady, right? When Mother Teresa won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979, Dan Rather, uh, who was a CBS news anchor, he flew to Calcutta to interview her. He spent a whole week with her, just, you know, seeing what she did, observing, watching, you know, the cameras were there. You know, by the way, all Mother Teresa did was, you know, take the people that were thrown in the gutter. She brought them in, and she loved them, right? Those that the world trashed, she treasured. And after spending a whole week with her, uh, Dan Rather said, you know, Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do what you do for all the money in the world. And she said, neither would I. <laughs> and he said, then why do you do what you do? And he said, because, she said, because every time I, I hold that dying man, that dying old man who's dying of dysentery, or, or the young mother dying of age, or that little little boy, that little baby starving for food and for love. When I look into their face, I see the face of Jesus. You see what Mother Teresa knew, that on every human being there's this imprint of the divine. Y'all, you have that. Whatever, wherever that imprint is, you have that in you and on you. You were made in the image of God. You have ultimate worth and value to God. The world didn't, didn't create you. The world didn't make you. So don't you dare let the world take that worth away 
It didn't give it to you. Don't let them strip it from you. We weren't just created with ultimate value and significance. We're also created for ultimate relationship. So last Thursday night, this was Dylan and Sarah. Dylan and Sarah, a couple of our colleagues. Do I have that pick? No pick? Maybe not? Okay. This is Dylan and Sarah at their wedding last Thursday night. This is under the chandelier at Everly Brooks on their way out. That was a pretty good kiss, but the one he gave her at the altar, that was even better. Uh, anyway, at the reception, there was all kind of great dancing. Uh, Dylan danced with uh, Sarah. Dylan danced with his mom, Lindsay. Uh, Sarah danced with her dad. And I think all these guys had these full-on rehearsed and practiced choreographed dancing. Now, we didn't do that back in the day, <laughs> but this was, it was so much fun, it was, it was really impressive, and Janie and I, we loved to dance. We finally got on the dance floor, and I, I think we were like, had to be pushed off later that night, and we stayed on there forever. Janie's a great dancer, me, not so much, uh, but I'm not concerned about how good I dance, not concerned about how we look trying to dance together, I just know that we belong together. After 40 plus years, we kind of fit together, right? And we kind of move together. We are to move together as one. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that we are created in the very image of God. Genesis 1, 26 says, let us make, let us make humanity in our image. Make no mistake this morning. We are radical monotheists. We believe in one God, but we're also Trinitarian in our theology. Our ancient creeds affirm that we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we believe that one plus one plus one equals one. The early church fathers used this Greek word, perichoresis, to talk about the eternal, always loving, always purposeful, always unifying relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The word perichoresis comes from two Greek words, peri, which means around, and then this word chorion, which means to give way. Guess what the traditional Greek wedding dance is called? Perichoresis. This is how Jonathan Marlowe describes perichoresis, also known as the great dance. He says, the couple start to go in circles, weaving in and out in this very pat beautiful pattern of motion. They start to go faster and faster and faster, all the while staying in perfect rhythm and in sync with each other. Eventually, they're dancing so quickly and yet so effortlessly that as you look at them, it just becomes a blur. Their individual identities are part of a larger dance. And so our church fathers first suggested perichoresis as a way to picture the inner relationship between the members of the Trinity. They called the inner life of the Trinity perichoresis, the great dance, because it gave them imagery to help them try to explain how God's profound peace was in this dynamic flow, because God's great power is in his eternal self is all about this profound give and take in a dance. The persons of the Trinity are equal but different, each deferring to the other in the profound and absolute love of this, this great dance. So look, I'm not trying to be crazy theological this morning. I, I just want all of us to know that our completely relational, perichoretic, dancing God, that he made us in his image. And as surely as he is a relational being, so too are we. Everything about the creation story is good, right? Light, land, sun, moon, fish, bird, animals, all good. Creation of humanity, very good. But the one thing that is not good is found in Genesis 2.18. It's not good for man to be alone. And so we were created for a relationship with him, and also for relationship with each other. So the new pandemic, in case you don't know, the new pandemic in our world today is not some new strain of some new physical disease. The new pandemic, especially in our country, is this thing called loneliness. 58%, 58% of Americans are lonely. That's, okay, just do the math, right? 
cut it right down the middle, there's about this many of us that are lonely. Is this affected by the isolation of COVID? Absolutely. Is this affected by all the divisiveness and ugliness and violence of our age? Absolutely. Affected by the so-called wonderful advances of technology? I'm supposed to be handling my phone, holding my phone in my hand right now. Yes. But our loneliness is also the work of Satan, driving us away from one another, pushing us into self-dependence and self-reliance and autonomy and isolation because he knows that if I belong to Jesus and you belong to Jesus, then we belong to each other. He's trying to do everything he can to attack us and push us away from each other and destroy our relationships. In 1937, Harvard University began a longitudinal study that lasted over seven decades. The purpose of the study was to just discover what makes life good. The study began with 300 men when they were college sophomores, and it followed them for more than 70 years through war, career, marriage, divorce, parenting, grandparenting, retirement, and old age. George Valiant directed the study for four decades, and when asked, what have you learned from all your research, he replied that the only thing that really matters in life is your relationships to other people. Now, by the way, we know there's more, right? We know there's this relationship too, but from a purely secular research project came this clear, radical conclusion. Relationships matter. A poor man surrounded by friends has wealth beyond measure while a rich man with no one to turn to is pitifully poor. Why? Because our God is triune. He's relational and he has made us in his image as relational beings. Genesis 2, 7 tells that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. We become alive not because of the chemical or physical makeup of our bodies. We become alive, not because of the, D the DNA sequencing of our identity. We become alive because of our total and intimate connection with and dependency upon God. You see, the moment he breathed his breath, he, the Hebrew word is, it's, it's wind, it's his ruach, his spirit. That's the Hebrew word. So the moment he breathed his spirit into us, that's when we became living beings. In the moment he breathed his ruach, his breath, his spirit into us, there was nothing in all creation that could ever fill this God-shaped void except him. I mean, try. Try if you want to put money in there. Try if you want to put possessions in there. Try if you want to put sports or, or whatever your hobbies are. Try if you want to put fame in there. Whatever. Nothing fits in here except God and his spirit. It's a, it's a God-shaped vacuum. You know, I want to keep dancing with Janie as long as I can dance. And I want to keep being filled with his Holy Spirit as long as I can breathe. That's that song we sang this morning. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. Come and fill us. You see, then and only then are we alive. Truly alive. Finally this morning, we're not just created with ultimate worth, not just created for ultimate relationship. We are created with and for ultimate purpose. I don't know if you know it or not, but our Lubbock Southwest Junior Baseball team qualified for the Junior Little League World Series, uh, which is for kids 14 and under. They got knocked out of the World Series up in Taylor, Michigan, early this week. In the 12 and under division, I watched part of the qualifying game between Utah and Montana. Utah was ahead 2-1 to one in the last inning. Montana got a boy on second and third with one out. And that's when the Utah coach, he walked to the mound, he made a pitching change. He huddled his boys up, he, he moved his first baseman to pitcher, he said some encouraging words to the whole team, and then he looked at 12-year-old, 5-foot, 10-inch, this guy's name is Brogan Coop. Now, I don't have him pitching, but that was him on first base. He, he is a hoss, all right? He's 12 years old, 5 foot 10, 
uh, I, I forget how much he weighed. Anyway, Coach looked Brogan. We called him Coop. Coach looked Coop right in the eye. He said, Coop, you were born for this. Now, I think I know what the coach meant, right? That Coop, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Coop, you were born with physical abilities that allow you to throw the baseball really hard. Coop, uh, you've got this, and we believe in you. You were born for this. But y'all, I'm not so sure Coop was born so he could pitch eight pitches and get two outs for his team to win the game so they might win the next game and go to the Little League World Series. By the way, spoiler alert, Nevada beat them. They didn't get to go. But anyway, but Coop did his job, right? But my, I really believe Coop was born for more than just throwing that baseball, even though he's really great at it. I'll always remember our daughter Haley's eighth birthday party. We had a whole bunch of girls over. We lived right off of here. Where am I? Right off of 69th Street in Frankfurt. We had a whole bunch of girls over for a sleepover, movies, pillow fights, uh, cake and ice cream, and presents. And one of the presents that Haley got that night was this. <laughs> Y'all remember this? Some of you girls would, right? All I know is I, Janie and I were working with college students at Wesley in, in those days, and so I just, so many, so many girls and guys, too, were struggling just with self-image stuff and their worth was all based on what they looked like, and, you know, and I just, I mean, it was, it was a big deal. I knew the struggle when they were 20, and here she is getting this gift at 8. And in the middle of the party, I said, hey, come and talk to me, you know. And so I took, took the Baywatch Barbie, and, and I, we took back in the room, and, you know, Haley knows I'm serious. And I said, Haley, I said, you know, it doesn't matter what color your hair is, and it doesn't matter how big these are, and it doesn't matter how small this is. You are a beloved, beautiful daughter of God. Don't you ever forget it, right? Okay, Dad. <laughs> who gets to say who you are? Who gets to say why you are? Only the God that created you. Only the God that died for you. Only the God that pours his spirit into you. Only he gets to say who and whose you are. Your purpose, your worth, your value is not in how fast you can run and how smart you are, not in how much money you make, not in the size of your house, not in the success of your career, not in the kind of car that you drive. Your purpose is found in who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. Your call, your purpose is not to look a certain way, but to be a certain way. You were cre not created to get a trophy, but to give your life to Jesus. You're not created to achieve or earn a certain status of life or a certain comfort or well-being. You were created to be loved and transformed by Jesus. You were created to love and transform this world, even as he has loved and transformed you. So this is the picture of Todd Sons. Uh, this is the mission trip. I know some of you all out there went on the mission trip. To the Navajo Nation. And uh, this is kind of classic Todd, if y'all know him nowadays. I think Todd's like 57, and there he is, you know, sitting down with kids, you know, just hanging out, right? But l last Monday night, uh, there were 250 of us that, that in the, you know, that back to school party we had at the tech pool. You know, we got rained out outside, moved inside. That's the loudest I've ever heard that indoor pool, by the way. Everybody had such a great time, but I think Todd, if I saw Todd, he was having the best time of anybody there, splashing, hanging out with kids and adults. But if you go back 40 years ago, Todd wasn't the kind of gregarious, always encouraging others pastor that he is today. Todd was a fierce high school basketball player for the La Mesa Tornadoes. Todd averaged 27 points a game his junior year, 29 points a game his senior year. He was all district, all region, all tournament player in four different tournaments that he played in. Todd's coach was Coach Roberts. And Coach Roberts was determined that his team would advance far into the state playoffs. And, and he knew that if they were going to do that, they had to be able to compete against and win against the 4A teams that were from the Metroplex. So they played them anywhere and everywhere they could. And one of those places was a mid-season tournament down in Midland. And Todd and his fellow Tornadoes had a 16-point lead over the Dallas team. And so they pulled the ball out. 
They went into a stall game. You know, you just pass and dribble, pass and dribble. You don't even think about scoring. You're just trying to take time off of the clock. The end result was that they surrendered their lead and ended up losing the game. This is what Coach Robert said to his team after the game. He said, you boys, you boys do, don't do so good playing not to lose. You do far better playing to win. So from now on, that's what we're going to do. We're going to play to win. Todd said, the rest of the year, we never pulled the ball out ever again. Boys, you don't do so good playing not to lose. You do far better playing to win. Don't we all? I mean, don't we all do far better when we're aiming for here, not settling for here? If God has his ultimate plan for us, then why are we settling for far, far less? Here's what he has for us. And maybe here's where we are. So, man, it's just too uncomfortable to keep looking for this when all we're getting is this. Right? Y'all know the most, what, six most dangerous words in marriage. Well, that's just who I am. Six most dangerous words in life. Well, it is what it is. I invite you this morning to claim your God-given, God-created destiny to know your ultimate worth, to experience that ultimate relationship that he has with him and he wants you to have with others and to follow his ultimate purpose for your life. Man, you are not who you were. You are who he has created you to be. Don't define yourself by your past. Don't define yourself by whatever's happened that, that you think has screwed up everything about your life. Define yourself the way he does. You're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Y'all, he loves you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. He just loves you. Let him, let him come and hold you. You, you, be that, you be that soft, moldable clay. Let the master potter shape you into the beautiful vessel he wants you to be. Not my way, Lord, yours. I close this morning just these words of Jesus. This is Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, if anyone would come after me, he's got to deny himself. <laughs> Just relinquish, just surrender yourself and take up your cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life has got to lose it. Whatever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. Because what good is it, y'all? What good is it for a man, a woman, to gain the whole world, to get it all and yet forfeit his life? Lord Jesus, this morning, come and Come and fix the parts of us that have gotten busted. Come and heal the parts of us that are broken. Lord, just come and recreate us. Just as you created us in the beginning, come and recreate us now of ultimate worth, for ultimate relationship, with ultimate purpose. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Y'all, we're going to sing just closing song had some time of response but just this altar's open Jesus will meet you right where you're sitting but I just kind of just make that prayer Jesus I belong to you y'all just hold your hands out y'all Jesus I belong to you Jesus, since I belong to you, come and fill me full and overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Have your way in me, have your way for me, and have your way through me. In Jesus' name. The world's going to be changed out there when we let Jesus change us in here.
faith will stand And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves The ocean dries my soul No. 
to hold you in the midst of the storm. Lord God, these are your children. Doesn't matter how old some of us are, right? We are your children. So come, Lord. Storms, water, rivers, fires, Lord, whatever's going on, keep our eyes on you and keep us held strong in your embrace. For today and tomorrow and always, Lord, we belong to you. In Jesus' name.